3, well understood. Quadimension 1 foliation on the three torus with dense leaves, typically when alpha and beta are rationally independent, and so on. So this is a very trivial and obvious example of a parabolic lamination. All leaves are flat. With the flat, when you induce them, when you put uh, the flat metric on the three torus, the leaves are flat, of course. Now you play the following game. You change, you do not change the foliation. You keep the very same foliation. But now you change the metric. So you put on the three torus a Riemannian metric, which is not flat. Of course, the leaves will continue uh, parabolic. They were parabolic, they will be still parabolic because the condition of being parabolic or hyperbolic is a quasi-conformal invariant. So if you change the metric, you still have a parabolic lamination, but with another conformal structure along the leaves. So the question is, can you make it flat? In other words, is it possible to change the metric by some conformal factor, exponential of 2u, to make it flat along the leaves? So this is the most, you know, this is the first parabolic foliation you can think of. Can you make it flat with a non, starting with a non-constant curvature metric on the torus? So this is, I think, quite a very, a quite natural question, but I'm, so, well, I'm surprised I cannot do it. It's, it's, it looks simple, but let me explain the, the few things I can do on this problem. But I can show the following. If one of the two numbers, alpha and beta, is rational, no problem, the answer is yes. If one of the two numbers, alpha or beta, is irrational, but satisfies some suitable diaphantine condition, then the answer is yes. So this is not difficult. I'm not going to prove it, but this is not difficult. I just want to give you uh, an idea of why this is true when alpha is rational. This is very obvious, because when alpha is rational, this means that the leaves are not plane, but cylinders. So what we have is, on each cylinder, we have a conformal structure. And our unique problem is to normalize it and to, to look for the corresponding scaling factor that we had yesterday. The affine structure is going nice in the transversal direction. We are looking for a way of choosing one flat metric among this line bundle of, 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 of flat metrics. And the way of doing it is, well, if you have a cylinder, you can normalize the flat metric on the leaf by asking this geodesic to have length one. This is a normalization co condition that chooses for you one and only one flat metric in the leaves. And now this is the solution, this is the proof of the theorem. It gives you a flat metric along the leaves. Now if the leaf is not a cylinder but dense, how can you normalize something? How can you say, well, among these flat metrics, I want to choose this one, which has some kind of recurrence of length one or something like that? Can you normalize in some suitable way such a metric? I don't know how to do that. In the general case, I would suspect that the answer should be yes, always, but by some very general principle that usually theorems which are true under diophantine conditions are not true under rational conditions. <laughs> That's the reason. Eh? So since we have an example where the theorem is true under rational condition and diaphantine condition, I would suspect that the answer should be always yes. That's, that's a nice question. OK. Now, let's try to begin our program of trying to understand if it's possible to embed a given lamination in projective space. So I should maybe begin by giving the solution of exercise number one of the first talk. So you remember we were looking at this three manifold SL2C modulo gamma and I was looking at the one dimensional complex 
lamination induced by left translation by diagonal matrices. And I said, well, this is a lamination by Riemann surfaces, and now you forget the complex structure on SL2C mod gamma. You just, re just want to know that this is compact space, foliated by two-dimensional by, by Riemann surfaces, and the exercise what was show that this does not embed in complex projective space. And the trick to see that is to notice that, well, if you don't know it, just believe me, that the action of C star by left translations has a lot of compact orbits. Geometrically, if you think of this as being a Kleinian group, and this as being the frame bundle of some hyperbolic three manifold, this corresponds to the existence of many closed geodesics in a hyperbolic three manifold. So in this compact metric space, don't forget that we forgot the complex structure. In this compact metric space, we have a lot of tori, and these tori are elliptic curves. They have a complex structure. And moreover, this is topological fact, most of them, or many of these tori, as two cycles sitting inside this six-dimensional real manifold are homologous to zero. Basically, this corresponds to the fact that many closed geodesics on the hyperbolic three manifold are homologous to zero. And this implies that the corresponding torus is a two-cycle which is homologous to zero in this six-dimensional manifold. Now, the proof that this uh, compact space does not embed holomorphically in projective space is just that if there were some kind of embedding like that, holomorphic along the leaves, of course, the image of these tori would, be, would, be, would contain an elliptic curve in complex projective space, which would be homologous to zero. And we know that this is not possible. An, an algebraic curve sitting in complex projective space is never homologous to zero. So that's the solution of the exercise number one. There is no way of embedding this compact topological space holomorphically along the leaves in some complex, complex projective space. Of course, this is just, this argument here is just uh, uh, showing that something general, there is some kind of general obstruction for embedding uh, lamination into complex projective space. So let me put it Explicitly, this is easy and, and not difficult to do it. Let me do it this way. Okay, suppose for a moment that our lamination is not a lamination but a foliation. That will be a slight problem in a moment. Suppose this is a manifold foliated by Riemann surfaces. So we have a foliation or lamination on a manifold. Now, suppose you have a, a foliation cycle. So I recall that I defined a foliation cycle as being a linear functional on two forms along the leaves, which vanishes, which is positive on positive forms, and which vanishes on uh, exact forms. Now, if you take the Durand forms, the two forms on the manifold, you can, of course, rest restrict them to the lamination. This gives you a map from two forms on the manifold to two forms on the lamination, and therefore uh, an element, a linear operator acting on omega squared, or m to r. This vanishing on closed forms, on exact forms, sorry. So if the composition of these two maps will give you a homology class on the manifold. So we have a homology class on the manifold, which is associated to the foliation cycle. So given a manifold with a foliation, this construction gives you a homology class associated to each foliation cycle. And the proposition is that if one can embed a lamination like that in projective space, this cycle, this homology class cannot be zero, cannot be homologous to zero. The proof is just the same one as, as the one I just gave you, that in complex projective space, cycles are not homologous to zero. So the proof is this. Suppose you can embed your uh, manifold in complex projective space. 
and uh, you pull back the symplectic form of CPN, you pull it back uh, on the manifold M so that you get a closed two form which is positive along the leaves. Now these closed two form being positive along the leaves by definition of what the foliation cycle is, the integral of it should be positive. This is definition of foliation cycle. So this foliation cycle cannot be homologous to zero because otherwise the integral of a closed form would be zero and this is positive. This is always the same argument. A number cannot be positive and zero. Yeah? So this cycle is not zero because evaluated on some closed form is not zero. Okay? So that's general fact. Easy, necessary condition. So what would be the guess? The guess would be that maybe we could try some kind of, con of conjecture like that. Maybe we could say, well, maybe this is the only obstruction to embed holomorphically a lamination. So, of course, let me begin by something silly. Of course, if you want to embed a lamination into complex projective space, your, your total space X should not be too big from the topological point of view. So you should ask at least finite topological dimension for your space. Otherwise, there is no way of embedding it. So let me assume this is natural condition. Let me assume that your space, the ambient space now, has finite topological dimension. Assume that no foliation cycle is homologous to zero. Does that imply that the space, the lamination, embeds holomorphically in PN? So this is the main question. However, the big problem is that this, till now, this question does not make sense. Let me explain why. I have no idea, at least today, of what could be the meaning of to be homologous to zero for a foliation cycle in general space. I don't even know how one can associate a homology class to a foliation cycle. Our spaces are bad spaces. I mean, they might be transversely Cantor space, for example. Hmm? So, what is a homology class? Should we use a singular homology theory? Probably not. It's not good enough because there's not enough room to get cycles. So, what kind of homology? Well, if the, if the ambient space is a manifold, we have the Ram theory. The Ram theory tells us, well, we have a cycle, we have a homology class, no problem. So, first thing to do would be try to use the correct homology theory which would be adapted to our situation. So the minimum requirement is that we want a theory which is such that any foliation cycle should give us a homology class. Second, we have this example of yesterday. You know, remember I hope this tree example. You know, this tree example is very rather complicated, it's transversely counter set. And since it's transversely counter set, there is no place for three, three chains in it. It's a, basically a two-dimensional object. So it does not contain any three simplex. So obviously, foliation cycle cannot be homologous to, to zero because there is no way of putting three simplex in it. So according to this vague conjecture, <coughs> Since there is no room for homology in that space, well, this tree example should embed, but it does not. Let me explain in a moment why it does not embed. So my, my, my problem here is that I still believe that this conjecture is true, but under a restatement of number one. I mean, you should be able, we should be able to define a correct homology theory allowing some kind of, of, well, some kind of homology going through the hole, some, so to speak. I'm going to show you an, in a moment an example. So this is still, I think, still conjecture, even though uh, this part one is not well defined. So the conjecture is define this in such a way that this is our equivalent. So, so let me explain in a moment, in, in a few words, why 
the three example of yesterday it does not embed in complex projective space. Well, the picture is this. The picture is that our example somehow contains something like a vanishing cycle or something like that. Picture is this. You know, it is possible to find in our space, in our example, it is possible to find a collection of curves, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, and so on, converging to a, to a curve gamma infinity, each one of these curves, gamma i, being a cycle, a, a closed curve in one leaf, and these sequence of curves being converging to gamma infinity in a limiting leaf, with the property that gamma 1 ga bounds some kind of domain d1, and which is a disk, and that gamma 2 bounds a bigger domain d2, which is another disk but more complicated, and the nth one bounds a still a disk but much, much bigger, and gamma infinity does not bound any finite disks because, you know, the creation of these four ends. Yeah? Remember this condition of foliation, which is exactly this, that, that no yeah. foliation cycle is in the boundary, is in the closure yeah. boundary of the current. Yeah, yeah. So the point is that uh, uh, this is not possible in complex projective space because, as you know, uh, 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 holomorphic curves in, in complex projective spaces are minimal surfaces, so it is not possible to have this blowing up of bubbles. So this is a proof that this example does not embed in projective space. However, now the question is this, take this example, think about it, and try to interpret this phenomenon as being kind of a homology between the foliation cycle, which is unique, and zero. So try to find the correct definition of homology theory in such a way that this picture means this cycle is homologous to zero. This is the question. Can you just take this aspect property as the necessary <laughs> condition? That's exactly what happened in the first definition of homology. Yeah, but I'm not sure if this... Uh, and then use Hans Bauman. <laughs> No, you know, the problem is, is, is this, that uh, 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 you know, take the theorem, foliation is taught, that uh, Yasha was mentioning, foliation is taught if and only if there is positive closed form um, <laughs> or under foliation. What could be the statement of that? Because they have no, uh, all forms are closed on a lamination. If I'm only allowed it to take derivatives along the leaves, everything is closed because it's top-dimensional. So what should be the word that should replace closed form? What kind of, of co-cycles should I use? That's, that's the point. I have nothing, I mean, I would be happy to have a space on which I can play the game with Hanbana. I have no forms. But I'm, well, this is not desperate. I mean, there, there should be some possibility. Okay, so we have one necessary condition for embedding in complex projective space. Unfortunately, there is another one that I'm going to explain now. And uh, this other uh, condition uh, is also a problem for me because I don't quite understand the relationship between this new necessary condition I'm going to explain now and the condition I explained to you a moment ago on the... Um, uh, boundary of, of, of foliation cycle. Here's the necessary condition. The condition is this. If you have an embedding of some Riemann surface lamination in complex projective space, well, you have you know, a compact set embedded in complex projective space, and you do what all algebraic geometers do, we just cross it with some hyperplane. When you cross it with the hyperplane, what you get uh, induced on the lamination is that what you would like to call a divisor. You get some section, which is this red points, which will be a divisor on the Riemann surface lamination. So let me try to put, to define some notion of abstract notion of divisor. And then the necessary condition will be, of course, if we want to embed something in projective space, we need at least 
the existence of divisors. Okay? You know, in, in Riemann surface, usual Riemann surface, divisor is just a collection of points. So you just take one point, it's a divisor, that's it. But for Riemann surface lamination, as you will see, it's not so obvious to construct divisors, and sometimes they don't exist. So let me just invent uh, a notion of divisor. Well, you could invent many. I mean, you could be more subtle. You, you know, there are many def definitions of divisors in, uh, in algebraic geometry. This is a very primitive definition. There are no Cartier divider, nothing, just set theoretical divisor. Hmm? So here's the definition of a divisor. So we have an abstract Riemann surface lamination. It's a compact space. Um, so uh, what's a divisor? It's a closed set that are denoted by H, which locally, when you look at it in a flow box, looks like what it should be. That is, looks like the zero set of a holomorphic function. So here's a flow box, D cross T, T is a transversal space, D is a disk, and you take a, whole, a, a function on that flow box, Z, T goes to F of Z, T, as usual, continuous in T and holomorphic in Z. And you look at the zero set of that function. So on each level, you have a finite number of zeros, and these zeros move continuously with the parameter t, except that at some points, at some values of t, you, you might have some collision between two points. So this is the definition of what a divisor. So here's a picture of what is not a divisor. If you take d, um, uh, d cross 0, 1, for example, and take this red curve in it. This is not a divisor because on the top disk you have two points and these two points are moving and colliding and just disappearing. This is forbidden for holomorphic functions. The zeros never disappear in, in, in algebraic geometry. They are always there. So you follow them. What? Yeah, put, put, yeah, this is, put minimal, put everything. Uh, yeah. For example, this function f is non-constant along the leaves and things like that. And you're right. There, there might be, there are some subtleties. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I want to emphasize that the definition I gave here looks holomorphic because I'm using holomorphic function, but it's not. It's just purely topological concept. Uh, divisor on the Riemann surface is just a closed set which locally looks like finite collection of points moving continuously and sometimes hitting together but never disappearing. That's purely topological definition. So at least if we want to embed something in space, complex space, complex projective space, at least we need the existence of divisors. That's not continuous. It, that's, that's, that, no, it, can yeah, this is my next transparency. Okay, I know that you prefer to think only in the case of transverse Lecanto, but I don't. I, I, pre, I, like, I like topology too, in transverse direction. Okay. So here are a few examples of divisors. First example is this. Assume you, you have a foliation which is taught on a three manifold. Then essentially by definition, I think that was first definition, not Yasha's definition, that was definition of, of, of Dave, that there is a curve, which is a transversal curve, and intersects uh, every leaf. So this curve by itself is a divisor. It's a good divisor, it's a transversal. So locally, it's just one point which is moving continuously. So for taut foliation, transversals will give divisors. So a taut foliation has non-trivial divisors. Now the second comment is the Dennis's comment. If you assume that you are only interested in laminations which transversally are cantor sets, then no problem. You take a finite collection of little transversals in your flow boxes, they are transversals. And because this is cantor set, this is continuous. I mean, there's a no problem. So if the, the, the transversal space is a cantor set, there is no problem with the topology. Is there some condition that every leaf has to have one yeah, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, this is related to what we his comment. I mean, there are, I'm, I'm, I'm cheating a lot. You should say things like that. Uh, did I write it? Yeah, I wrote it here. You know, uh, a divisor should intersect, did I write it? Yeah, intersect every leaf. Oh, okay. That's, yeah, there are some 
some tricks there. But okay, so by definition, the divisor should intersect the relief. Okay, so we have at least two interesting families of examples of Fourier of laminations having divisors. Here's a third example that I like. But this is not an example, it's an exercise. No, that's, that's a, an exercise that I don't know, I don't know how to do. Consider, uh, let's say, a smooth manifold, M, which is fibering over some base, B, and assume that the fibers are surfaces of genus greater than or equal to 2. That's the assumption. Think of this vibration as a two-dimensional foliation. Exercise. This is, a, this is a purely topological question. I would be happy if any topologist in the audience could prove it for me. Exercise. Prove that there is a divisor by purely topological methods. The proof that I get here is really not honest. And, and I just, this is not fair. And well, here's the proof. Pick any complex structure along the fibers. You get a continuous they get vibration by Riemann surfaces. Now, if the genus is bigger than or equal to 2, these fibers are Riemann surfaces and therefore have Weierstrass points. Weierstrass points are very specific, finite family of points in the fiber, and they move continuously. They might collide, but this is a continuous family of finite points. So this gives a divisor. But this is using some techniques that I don't like. This is a nice question from topology. You have any vibration whose fiber has genus greater than or equal to 2, prove that this vibration always has what we would like to call a multi-section. It's something which associates to a point in the base a finite set of points which is moving continuously. Yeah? Well, the top line of proof would be form the high symmetric product. Yeah, I tried to... In terms of algebraic topology, choose a section. I try to do it, but you know, there are many obstructions. I mean, yeah. I see. I, well, I, I try that, of course. But that's, yeah. So the. the, the, the that would be the yeah, yeah, that would be the algebraic proof. Uh, so uh, why, why is this question interesting? Uh, by itself, it's not very interesting. I think it is interesting because the real question is maybe not this one. The real question is to know if these two necessary conditions I found. Existence of divisor and uh, no foliation cycle homologous to zero, they should be the same. Really, I believe that these two conditions are kind of the same conditions. Even though, uh, uh, you see, uh, the second line, no foliation cycle is homologous to zero, as I told you a moment ago, well, I did not define that. So. Uh, uh, the point was to define it in such a way that two things were equivalent, so now you have to redefine it in such a way that this is equivalent. <laughs> so this should be the same, basically. And the exercise is to see that at least from top to bottom, this is true, at least when the bottom makes sense. That is, for example, if it's a manifold. No, I told you that in, in the um, in in uh, let me see. This is a good comment, I think. Um you're right. You're right. You're right. Uh, but let me write some positive divisor somewhere. I mean, uh, <laughs> the, the comment is that um, uh, the tree example has the property that we decided 10 minutes ago that the foliation cycle, we should consider it as being homologous to zero. Okay, because we had these bubbles and so we took the decision that this Green line, uh, uh, the green, the green okay. And uh, uh, we I explained also that there is divisor. So uh, this is counterexample. He's right. Um, I, you know, I, I know how to modify this. You know, um, so really, I should say, 
uh, there exists a divisor intersecting the foliation positively. Yeah. Okay, this is not conjecture. But you can modify it. I mean, this, this last talk is just wavy. <laughs> okay. Okay, let me go to some positive statements. Here's one theorem. Theorem is this. Suppose you have a compact lamination and assume the uh, conditions that are presented here. First, finite topological dimension. This is the least you can ask if you want to embed in complex projective space. Assume you have one, at least one divisor and assume all these are hyperbolic then you can embed it into complex projective space. So, for example, this is what I promised in the first day. For example, taut foliations, because we have divisors. And for example, foliations which are like solenoids, transversely cantor sets, because we have divisors. So anything like that can be embedded into uh, complex projective space. So this is the good case because all leaves, are, all leaves are supposed, are assumed to be hyperbolic. What about the not so good case when all leaves are parabolic? So we have seen that. Are you going to discuss the proof? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we have seen that uh, the parabolic situation is not so good. So this explains why the result I'm going to present now is not so good. It's a little bit technical. Under a suitable condition, the same thing is true. So what's a suitable condition? Um, okay, so take a, a Riemann surface lamination, take a metric along the leaves, and you assume that will be the subject, assume all leaves are parabolic. And we want to know if it's possible to embed. You know, I think of these as kind of generalized elliptic curves. And I want to construct elliptic functions. I want to embed them into uh, projective space. So pick a leaf L. So by assumption, this leaf is conformal to C. So there's a conformal isomorphism from C to L. And yes, just compute at the point Z, compute the norm of the derivative of this field. The norm is computed using on the left hand side the usual metric on C and on the right hand side the metric that you have G. So this is a number because this is a Hermitian metric. And this is the technical condition I don't like. I don't even know one example when this is not satisfied. The technical condition is assume this function grows at most like a polynomial in the modulus of Z. So I, for example, assume there is a flat metric along the leaves. If there is a flat metric along the leaves, like for example the tessellation space that I described in the first talk, if there is a flat metric along the leaves, this function V of Z is just a constant one. So assume there is no exponential growth on this conformal map. Then Theorem is, if all is hyperbolic, finite dimension, plus existence of divisor, plus the silly condition star, then there is holomorphic embedding in complex projective space. So as you know, it's not, it's not as nice. We would like to remove this assumption, or maybe not remove it, prove it. It might be always the case. Okay. So let me go through an uh, 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 some idea of how to prove these kind of theorems, which is not difficult. Nothing very deep there. I mean, things are very deep, but very old. OK, so let me begin by very the, the case that I decided was not interesting and too easy, but too begin our game, let's begin by the trivial case when leaves are elliptic, just to make some idea. 
So let's show that if you have an elliptic fiber, an elliptic for lamination, by this I mean a lamination, all of whose leaves are elliptic um, uh, uh, P1s, spheres. Oh, I'm so, there is always this problem. I, I hope it's not confusing. You know, elliptic, an elliptic curve is a torus, and a torus is parabolic. So you should be careful. I hope it's not confusing for you. Yeah, this is, this is not. Yeah, this is not a, a spherical lamination. Yeah, spherical. Yeah, yeah. So I hope it's not confusing. Yes. So take a spherical lamination. So all leaves are spheres. Assume it's finite topological dimension, then you can embed it into projective space. So uh, the proof is just using a little bit of a very elementary algebraic geometry. And just, uh, just a comment. In particular, this implies that there is a divisor. This is consequence. Hmm? Already, already, I think it's a, is it deep or not? Already it's an interesting, that's an interesting exercise for topologists. Any sphere bundle has a multi, a multi section. Hmm? Yeah, but then you have this, uh, uh, the associated bundle is uh, CP infinity and, uh, but I don't see why there should be section. I don't see why there should be a section. Well, I, okay, so here's the proof. First, you associate, this is very classical and very mentally, yeah? you associate to the complex projective line CP1 a finite dimensional vector space. This is the vector space of those holomorphic tensors on CP1 of the form G of Z, D, D, Z to the kth power, this is a formal kth power, this is the kth power of the tangent, bun of the tangent, tangent bundle to uh, CP1. And uh, uh, the fact that they are holomorphic sections means that G is a polynomial of degree less than or equal to 2. So this is a finite dimensional vector space of dimension 2K plus 1, which is canonically associated to CP CP1. And if you change the coordinates by, an act by a projective transformation of PGL2C acting on CP1, you have an associated uh, uh, linear transformation on the space of these tensors. Okay, so now what you do is that you replace, this is ex essentially what Dennis is saying, you replace the fiber by this finite dimensional vector space. So the trick is this, you take an ellipt a spherical vibration, you start with a spherical vibration, here it is, so as we know, uh, so this is vibration over some base, and the fiber is CP1. Now you take the associated bundle, that is you construct the bundle I denoted by EK, which is a bundle over B, whose fiber is this vector space E sub K of CP1, it's the associated bundle. So now it's a vector bundle over B, and as you know, if you have a vector bundle over a finite dimensional space, well, if the dimension of the fiber is big enough, you have sections which are not vanishing anywhere. So you choose k big enough, you fix an n, and you choose k big enough in such a way that this new vector bundle over B has n sections. And you can even do that, that, that in such a way that above each point, little b in the basis B, the n tensors, S1 of B, S2 of B, Sn of B, have no common zeros, because after all, these tensors are polynomials. So you assume that they have no common zeros. It's just by counting co-dimension, there's no problem. So once you have that, well, this gives you an embedding, or at least a map, from the space, x total space, to complex projective space. How do you do? Pick a point in the space x, well, this point belongs to some fiber. On that fiber, you have chosen n sections, so you have n polynomials, so you have n complex numbers. Now, these complex numbers depend on the chart that you use, but if you change the chart, you multiply all of them by the same number. So really what you have is a canonical map 
from these sections from, from X to CP n minus 1. And since the construction is very flexible, many sections and so on, you can do this construction in such a way that this is an embedding, and of course, it is by definition, by construction, it is holomorphic along the fibers. So that's the proof of the easy case. This is very easy, no problem. This is uh, easy. So now we want to do the same thing with hyperbolic leaves. So we are going to do the exact same trick, except that we shall copy uh, Poincaré. You know, Poincaré was smart enough to construct neuromorphic functions on any Riemann surface by some very clever trick. So I should recall uh, this Poincaré trick. So uh, here's Poincaré trick. You start with a compact Riemann surface and you take its universal cover and you assume that you are in the hyperbolic case that is you assume that your universal cover is the Poincaré disk then you can recover the surface as being the quotient of the disk by some discrete co-compact uh, Fuchsian group now the uh, observation of Poincaré is that if you consider this series the sum on all the elements of the group of the derivative of the square of the moduli of the derivative of gamma this is a converging series well square of derivative it means derivative with respect to the z coordinate I mean this after all are transformation az plus b divided by c z plus d so you compute derivative with the z coordinate the usual coordinate and the fact that this series is converging is just corresponds to the fact that since the group is acting discreetly you can find around the point Z a small ball, a small disk and all the images of this disk are disjoint, two by two disjoint so the total sum of the area uh, of the areas is bounded by the area of the disk and essentially this term gamma prime Z squared is essentially the area of this disk so since this summation of all areas is converging this summation is also converging this is not difficult then what uh, Poincaré does is that he constructs the following well he starts with a rational function r of z any rational function and then he defines omega sub r as being the summation over all gammas in the group gamma of gamma star, the pullback of the quadratic differential form r of z dz squared. So you, th you think of this rational function as being a quadra quadratic differential form, you s take its images under the group, take the sum of all of these things along the, the group, and the previous observation means that this uh, sum is converging and uh, so this gives you a, ration, um, a meromorphic quadratic differential omega sub r which is by construction invariant under the group so starting from a rational function r you construct canonically so to speak a meromorphic quadratic differential on the surface which is invariant under gamma now the trick is to, to do it twice you take two rational functions R1 and R2 you get two meromorphic quadratic differentials omega R1, omega R2 take the quotient the quotient of two meromorphic quadratic differentials is a meromorphic function and then you have a meromorphic function on your surface but the trick is not finished because now you have to show that it's non-constant meromorphic function and the, the clever idea is that if you choose R in such a way that it had a pole somewhere in the middle of the disk then this construction will construct for you a meromorphic function which has a pole and therefore is non-constant okay 
Okay, so what we want to do, and that will be very quick, well, take this idea and just copy. Do the same thing. Do the same thing for uh, a lamination by uh, uh, hyperbolic leads. So, the proof is finished, essentially. Let me just explain a few things. Well, so we start with the lamination. We assume all these are hyperbolic. This is assumption. We assume that this is finite dimensional. And we assume, well, for simplicity of this talk, I will replace the assumption existence of a divisor by existence of a transversal, which is stronger. So we assume there is a transversal. So the picture is this. Here is x. The green leaves are the uh, lamination that we are given. And the red line h is the divisor. Now what we have to do first is to try to mimic the construction of, of, of Poincaré. We need a universal cover. So what we do is just the following. Starting from this transversal red line, you take the exponential map along the leaves. This gives you a map, uh, this gives you a bundle, a disk bundle over the red line, which is just universal covers of all leaves. And the theorem of Kandel that I described the other day means exactly that this bundle of Poincaré disks along this edge is a nice locally trivial bundle. It's a, it's a nice bundle by disks. And we have a map from this bundle uh, that I call X tilde because it's something like universal cover of the foliation. We have a map from X tilde to X, which is just the obvious one, which on each leaf is just the universal cover of that edge. So you have a nice map like that. We think of this as being kind of universal cover of the foliation. And uh, we have everything that we need to construct uh, uh, mirromorphic uh, quadratic forms. So we do the same thing as Poincaré did. Well, three steps. For each point in X, in this transversal here, I'm working now on the left side of X tilde. For each point X on the transversal, I choose on that disk a rational function having a pole there. So I choose a rational function of that disk having a pole, depending on X, of course, of the form P uh, sub X of Z divided by Z to the nth power, nth big number, dz squared. So on each, on each disk, I have a rational, quadra rational quadratic form having a pole on that point. Now, if I take n big enough, the finite dimensionality of my space means that it is possible to choose in a continuous way for each point on the divisor on, a, on the red line, it's possible to choose for each point x on that divisor a quadratic form like that, p sub x of z, and so on. And I can do it in such a way that really at each point x, this is, a, this is a pole, that is p sub x of 0 is not 0. So if you take n big enough, the topological condition on the dimension of the space means that this is possible. Well, I don't see how the n and the dimension are related. What? I don't see the relationship between the two. Uh, capital N should be big enough in order to, you know, uh, oh, I didn't say, uh, what's uh, p? Uh, P sub X of Z is a polynomial. Uh, uh, I'm just interested in the, you know, to, to understand the main term at zero, I only need the first n coefficients of, uh, of this P. So this is a, basically an n-dimensional vector space. So what I really want is that this n-dimensional vector space has a section which is not vanishing. So this gives, on this space that I call universal cover of the foliation, this gives a uh, uh, quadratic, meromorphic quadratic differential, and then the next step is to do what is usually for, forbidden, 
we push forward a differential form. So that means that we have a differential, differential form on this object x tilde, we push it forward. This means that on a given point on the target space, we take the summation of all prime images of the differential forms. So really, this is exactly the analogous thing as Poincaré was saying, you know, this summation of all gammas. So this is converging for the exact same reason of growth argument, and we get a meromorphic quadratic differential along the leaves of the foliation. Now, if you do it twice with one divisor and another divisor, you get two meromorphic functions, two meromorphic quadratic differentials, and if you take the quotient of these two, you get a meromorphic function. So this is not No, it's transversely continuous. What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm using that, of course. Yeah, I'm using that. Yeah, yeah. So that's it. When you construct in this way, um, you construct in this way uh, many meromorphic functions, and it's enough to construct uh, embeddings in, in projective space. Well, the proof for parabolic case is basically the same. Just instead of mimicking uh, um, Poincaré, you just do the same thing as Weierstrass for construction of uh, elliptic functions. What? Yeah, except, yeah, I, I agree with you, except that this is not really a measure, it's a differential form. It's kind of, you're right, you're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so. Uh, this is the end of the mini course. Uh, so uh, I think that because it is a mini course, uh, and it uh, uh, should finish with some uh, final exam. <laughs> so I prepared a final exam. I'm going to ask you questions, and uh, I'm going to make a few statements. <laughs> some of them will be true, some of them will be wrong, some of them are not known. Okay. So I'm going to ask you this question, so uh, you please do not communicate with your neighbor, <laughs> okay? Do not cheat, okay? Okay. Okay, so I hope you will pass, okay? <laughs> okay. So here's question one. This is easy one. Hope so. The red foliation of S3 embeds holomorphically in complex projective space. Five seconds. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes. No, they're communicating. They're communicating. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. That was question one. <laughs> okay, so the answer is no because the Compact leaf is homologous to zero, and this cannot be in complex projective space. I hope you did it. Huh? Question two. The solenoid, which is associated to an expanding map of the circle, embeds in CP2. Hmm? Question mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I don't know. <laughs> this is unknown. Are you allowed to answer yes, no, or unknown? I don't know. I really, uh, as Dennis said, I explained to you this embeds in CP3. It might embed in CP2. So I think it's a good question. Yeah. You know, this is a very concrete example. Maybe this might be a counterexample to Camacho's conjecture. So in other words, maybe you can think the other way around. Start with this example. This is a very nice, explicit example of lamination. It's very good, has no foliation cycle. Try to put it in projective space, projective plane. Maybe this is an example. It's not so hard. Hmm? Well, if you have it better to see P3, Well, if you project it down to P2, you get in self intersection. Well, so. Yeah. Just you a this gives you a what? This gives you a self-intersection divisor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So what is the meaning of that divisor? 
Well, you are, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Question three. The harmonic current with zero Euler characteristics is a Fourier cycle. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> the answer is yes. This is con theorem. Please give me a proof that I understand. <laughs> I wish, yeah, this, this is really a topological statement. I want to understand it without, you know, I, without these uh, elliptic operators and things like that. No, but there, I mean, yeah. Intuitively, non compact surface has negative curves. Yeah, I agree with you. This is a very intuitive statement. A very intuitive statement. I mean, there, are, there is somebody's theorem in differential geometry that, that uh, surfaces have so much negative curvature, unless they're extremely simple. Sort of yeah, this is a good exercise. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> okay. Four. Elimination with hyperbolic leaves admits non-trivial holomorphic quadratic differentials. <laughs> Are you good students? Did you listen to me? <laughs> Ah, somebody's saying yes. He's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just constructed meromorphic quadratic differentials. You know, some functions... <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> A trick question. <laughs> okay, I constructed meromorphic functions. No holomorphic function. So, I don't know. This is a question that I had yesterday by... Uh, uh, Adam Epstein. I think, yeah, I, th I was thinking this morning uh, uh, when I wrote that, I think I know a counterexample. I think I know examples of laminations by hyperbolic leaves which are rigid. No holo the Taj Mahal space is just one point. So that, um, I think so. Good question, but you know, you're not supposed to know it. But I never said there was. Okay? You know, the instructor is supposed to. Five. Parabolic laminations in CPN admit metrics which are flat along the leaves. I don't know, but I think yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know either. Yeah. I told you, it's, I think it's a good question. The, you know, these examples of nasty, nasty parabolic positions as described are really, uh, uh, they don't embed in CPN. Uh, it, it would be very interesting, I think, to, to prove positive statements for laminations in, sitting inside CPM. Yeah, and the sixth one is this. Riemann and Poincaré were great mathematicians. <laughs> I think we all agree. Uh, you know, 150 years later, we are still thinking about what they did. This is really incredible. So, uh, if you got at least one good answer, <laughs> <laughs> if you get got a st at least one good answer, you get an A. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much. Okay, so uh, references. Uh, you know, I'm I'm finishing to write down a survey paper on that. Yeah. Question there. So, so since you can get these laminations with parabolic, some of them. Well, any of them. Yep. Yep. Have you thought something because I think more than one of them is critical. Well, you will get some kind of quasi-periodic yeah, function, why not? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it looks like, pen, for example, Penrose tiling, you can do it. You get very nice, you know, it, it, take your favorite construction of elliptic functions on, on, on elliptic curves, you have this lattice acting, replace the lattice by, by quasi-periodic thing, you get something very nice. 
okay? So, uh, if there is no more question, I think I have the pleasant duty to thank Michel. Yeah, that was very, uh, very, I think he had a very good idea to mix the, all these people. I was very happy to realize that there were so many different points of views. And thanks to you, I know now that I'm a string theorist. <laughs> so thank you very much. <laughs>